The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. So thanks for coming. My name is Nate McConnell and we're going to be talking about becoming a Rails developer, the rest of the story. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. A little background about myself. I am chief architect at Synaptian. Contact information is there. Synaptian is a primarily Rails uh, Rails shop. We also do iOS, Android, ERP, uh, e-commerce solutions. So, I mean, we run the gamut. We've got managed services and things like that. So the purpose of the talk is for anyone that wants to become a Rails developer or has already tried to become a Rails developer or has taken on folks who say they are Rails developers, you find that there's much more to becoming a Rails developer than simply learning Rails. And when you get down to it, learning Rails is hard because it encompasses a wide range of technologies. So to more efficiently uh, learn Rails, you need a process. And so this is the process we will get into. So when you start learning Rails, there are three key challenges, um, which entail a lot of technical details. First, you have to understand Ruby. And a lot of folks that start becoming a Rails developer will just jump right into a Rails tutorial, start running, you know, install the framework, running commands. And if they don't know Ruby first, they will often get Ruby the language confused with Rails the framework and not be able to know which is which. So that can be kind of confusing. Um, they also have to have a fairly good grasp of the MVC pattern and all of its details. And of course, the object-oriented model, because if you're going to use Ruby efficiently within Rails, you need to know OO properly. And so I've outlined, there are many, many of these slides that detail the core competencies for Ruby on Rails. And while you might sit there and say, okay, well, these make sense, that's Ruby. Or we get down here and you've got, hey, these are Rails framework. What you might not think about or what a lot of people don't think about are version control, text editors, and it, it really goes on and on. So we'll come back up here to this back to where we were with just Ruby. So if you are going to become a Rails developer, you're going to go through a process. The first thing you should start with is Ruby because you have to know the language before you can use the framework that it's built off of. And so the key competencies that you should learn when you're doing Ruby would be IO programming, classes, modules, attributes, methods. And the way these are broken up is that most of these are what you will see a junior dev or someone right fresh out of college probably have some familiarity with, but nowhere near the depth that you would expect a rock star, I'm not a big fan of that term, but a rock star developer to have. And so as part of our process, we've, which I'll get to in just a moment, we've tried to focus on giving our junior developers uh, goals with specific technologies that focus on the foundational competencies and then get further into the um, finer details. So things like, you know, the, the REPLs and procs and lambdas, that's not going to be something you would expect a junior dev to tackle immediately. Maybe, but it really just depends on the background. So if you're going to give someone a guide, um, a path to learning Ruby, Traditionally, you want to get your hands wet before you just jump in the deep end. So we recommend that you try out Ruby in the browser. So you don't have to worry about installing it. You've got a fully functional development environment and you can play around with learning the language itself. Next step would be obviously you've gotten some initial infatuation with Ruby and you're like, hey, I want to take this home, you know? So you're going to install your local dev environment. You'll look at the Ruby installer and some sort of Ruby version management because one of the pains of working with Ruby or Rails is that the versions change all the time 
and nothing, well, very few things are up to date. But that's, that's quite a challenge, particularly for a concept of junior developers to grasp, because most programs don't teach you version control, or even the concept of managing change management, release management, and things like that. So when a new version comes out, you go to bundle your gem file, things break because the gems aren't up to date. You have to explain these concepts and you want to build on those. So once they've gotten those down, generally they will start turning to the internet, right? That's what everyone does when you're first learning a language or learning a framework or learning something new. You say, hey, I've got an error, I've got a problem, and you start Googling for it, right? Well, that's not always the best case because it's not structured. So we try to point them towards a more structured approach, like several of the books, say Programming Ruby or the one from Manning Press, uh, Learn Rails. And, and what these books do is from start to finish, they walk you through building an app and all of the extras that slowly come into play with it. And then once you've got that under your belt, then you can start taking a look at some of the screencasts, which tackle specific problems, and going through some of the more complete and complex courses, like the one on test-driven development with, from Ruby Cones. And so here we get into, you've learned Ruby, now you're going to start learning Rails. Hopefully that's the order you went in. Not often the case that we see that, but in the Rails framework, you've got standard MVC and its various things. Asset pipeline tends to be a big issue, and when folks are Googling or reading blogs, you, since the Ruby versions change and the Rails versions change so frequently, a junior dev will go and find a blog, copy the code out of it, because you know, they're in the copy-paste mode from college, and the blog never mentions that, hey, this is Rails 3, the asset pipeline just came in in 3.2, and they'd expect you to know that. But the junior dev developers don't know that, so things like that can be little gotchas to say, hey, don't run off to this blog, don't start searching for code, let's, let's go in a structured path here. Um, and there's a lot of competencies for the Rails framework, some of which you would expect them to learn after a project or two, some not really. Like authorization, authentication, you could give that to a junior developer and let them tackle it. It's not a complex concept. But multi-tenancy, not so much. So how do you acquire those competencies and learn Rails? Our owner and I are of um, two different schools of thought on this. So he thinks that you should start with the books as opposed to the guides. I think you should start with the guides if you can find a good guide. Because a lot of the guides out there tend to be very mm, scattered. They don't have the structure of the book going through the apps like I was talking about from start to finish, but you can find very good guides, or you can just point them to the Ruby on Rails website, which is everything they ever wanted to know, and they don't know where to start. So probably would move that down if I were still editing this. And then we go to the screencasts, and now we're starting to get into some of the things that they don't really realize. So you're teaching them how to learn Rails, how to learn Ruby, They've got the MVC structure down, they've committed their first controller, or they've created their first controller and their views, and all of a sudden you're like, okay, so you committed that and pushed it up the repo, right? And you just get this deer in headlights blank stare. So as you're learning Rails, you need to also build in the extra stuff, the rest of the story as it were. And that's where we'll move on to this. And so to do that, what we've done is, through trial and error, come up with, we started out having, assuming that everyone would be able to drive themselves in learning Ruby, then learning Rails, and all of the extras. But the every man for himself approach doesn't really work when you're trying to have an organized development team and get everybody on the same page. So we've started mentoring, and we have mentors that are assigned to each new developer, and that mentor guides them through a starter project, like working through the book. And what we're trying to put in place, or what the plan is, is to have a single starter project that can evolve over time through various user stories, 
or that the new junior developer can recreate from scratch based upon the same requirements that the previous ones have. And what you will get out of that, hopefully, and what the research and reading indicates, is that as each new developer takes a set of requirements and from start to finish creates that starter app, new features and new ways of doing things will evolve that you can merge back in. Once the starter app is done and they've learned pretty much the architecture of Rails and how to develop just a basic Rails app, then you can move them on to real life projects because they understand all of the extras. They know what commits are, they know what pull requests are. So, and we get to pull requests next because we have code review. And I, a lot of places I've been don't do code review or if they do code review, it's self review. So even the most experienced developer can benefit from having a second or third set of eyes. And when you do code review and you have someone else review your code, you're sharing the knowledge. So the, if a junior developer is reviewing the code that a senior developer wrote, then they're going to glean some of that advanced knowledge. They may not understand it yet, but they'll at least gain some familiarity with it. And you're also running into being able to ensure that your production code keeps the highest quality that it can. Because generally, you're going to have your senior devs review the junior devs. Junior devs at least take a look, but maybe someone else will do an additional review, right? So we may have two junior developers review the code of a senior developer. Unfortunately, there is a downside to this. And if a junior developer has committed their code and they're waiting on it to be reviewed before they can keep going, but the senior developer is not available, you don't have enough senior developers to manage the number of junior developers that you have, that can be a, a bottleneck for growth and for development because they're going to be blocked on further code. And if you increase the number of junior developers that you have beyond the number of people that your senior developer can actively manage, you're inhibiting the growth of your company. So that brings us to the last step, which is pair programming. And I have to say that most of the developers are very reticent to do pair programming. The concept of someone always looking over your shoulder and I can't type the way I always do when someone's watching me, I make more errors. But if you can just kind of push past that initial um, hurdle, then you'll find that they work together to not only develop the best feature possible because they're both contributing to the code and the ideas are coming from two different places rather than just one single mindset as the code is being developed. So they both improve their skills, you get better code out of it, less bugs, but the downside is you're doing twice the manpower so for the same amount of work. Now ideally as your programmers, your developers become more accustomed to the concept of pair programming and the practice of it, then you'll see that the efficiency increases. So it's not quite twice the manpower, but that's worst, worst case scenario there. So we've put these in practice, or tried to, um, and I can't say that we use them all all the time. So it really depends on specific situations, but we definitely, when they outweigh any conventional system, we do use these. And I've just got a quote here that experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. So that's Rails. When you stop there, most people say, hey, I know Rails. I can go get a job for $150,000 a year as a Rails developer in DC. No, you can't. Maybe 40, 50, 60 K at, yeah. <laughs> So when we get into the other stuff that is involved, all the extra stuff that most people don't take into account. You've got Ruby gems and its management, version control, the ID and text editor, and a lot of small startups will just give their developers free reign and say, you are all adults, you are all have your own development machine that you're working off of every day. You know, we're not providing company computers with an image pushed to them. It's, this is your, probably your personal laptop. You're bringing it in to work at the office. So go ahead and use the text editor, the IDE of your choice. 
Well, when you don't lay out those company standards, you run into a lot more issues with efficiency, learning, and then, of course, if you do allow them to bring in their own, you may end up with the whole holy wars of text editors with everybody arguing over which is the best. How many VI fans do we have? Yeah. And, and how many, say, uh, Visual Studio fans? Yeah. I consider those the two opposite ends of the spectrum there. I prefer uh, something like Sublime Text or TextMate myself. But. Then you get into the software engineering aspects because as you're asking your developers, your junior developers to move on to a real world, real world project, they're going to be taking user stories and actually having to engineer the code. So in our experience, probably a third to maybe half of our junior developers are still in college, in undergraduate, and we like for them to have had software engineering but that's not always the case. So it's definitely something that is often overlooked. And as we have started to give them more specific goals, we started to include, hey, here's how you, you know, do a user story. Because they may walk in and say, we need you to write three user stories based on these requirements. And you get the deer in headlights look again. So agile processes, most people don't even go into that. I mean, you might touch on an undergrad, but it's not something you would go on until grad school in any depth. And most of these aren't things that you would get taught in school anyway. I know that the program, the undergraduate program in our town, doesn't touch upon Git, GitHub, any sort of software version control, uh, source code management. So that's kind of a bummer. And then, of course, you get into the database side of things. You'll find most of your Junior developers will have some sort of familiarity with these, but not, say, the N plus one avoidance and things like that. Testing, we're a huge, I'm a huge advocate of test first, then write code. But that's not what your junior developers are going to be familiar with, even if they know how to write a test. So conditioning them, uh, grooming them, to know how to write a test, when to write a test, and how to write code based upon that test is, is a very important thing. So that's something that is deeply ingrained in the Rails community. But most of your, hey, go out and learn Rails, courses online, more of them these days, but most of them historically, or the blogs, won't include testing. It's like, here's the Rails code for creating a controller, modifying it a bit, don't worry about testing. Somebody else will do that. Bad practice. Then, of course, you get into deployment. Various topics there. Most of your junior developers won't be doing deployment, but they will be. You will need to make them familiar with the terms of, say, continuous deployment, continuous integration. And as they um, grow as a developer, you might give them some of those tasks. And one of the biggest uh, efficiency hurdling blocks that we've encountered is dealing with the World Wide Web stuff. The HTML, CSS, um, various CSS frameworks like Twitter Bootstrap or Zurb Foundation. And you'll find that some of your developers will have had the basic 101 web design course. Others might have gone into an advanced web design course where they've learned more CSS and specifically JavaScript. But that's not required. Say, you know, information technologies generally do JavaScript, but Core CS generally don't. And so when you're working in Rails, you're obviously going to need to style your views. And we found a, a large discrepancy or, or variation in the skill levels and the efficiency uh, of the work output that various developers can do. So what we try to do, or what the plan is, would be when you have a certain view, you show them how to create your, say, style sheets and your core underlying HTML the proper way from the beginning. Because a junior developer, how many of you are familiar with Rails? So Rails has a very large, extensive directory structure. And if you're experienced with Rails, then it makes sense. You know, app, views, you know, 
etc. App assets, style sheets, this is where you put these things. And if you create a view for show help page, then you should create a style sheet for show help page that only has the styles for that page. Well, what you'll see that the most of the, your, your junior developers will do, one, they won't know where those things should go, and you'll end up with hugely overcomplicated views, and two, they'll just make one large 19,000 line long CSS sheet, and then sit there and try to figure out why will this one thing not override for you know, two hours, three hours, trying to Google it. So showing them the architecture and showing them how to properly implement or develop their code based upon the architecture is, is a huge thing. And there's even more. So then you get into your CSS, your JavaScript, client-side libraries, and then some competencies that folks, even if you're thinking about, hey, I need to know web, pro or, or web coding, I need to know JavaScript, I need to know database, you might not think about, I need to know how to work on a, a Nix server, I need to know how to manage that, be comfortable in the command line, because you're going to be doing package deployment, package management, and then of course, being able to increase your speed and get more work done, Knowing the commands on a Unix command line is a good thing. And you'll find that, particularly in most modern programs, they walk in day one and here's Visual Studio, nothing but Microsoft, and you ask them to do anything away from the IDE, and again, it's Google for an answer, try it, nope, that didn't work. And so it's just building that familiarity and, and the confidence in themselves. So you'll often find, and the first thing here is what you'll see junior developers usually do, and then what you should try to guide them towards. So junior developers will often go to blogs, and many blogs, as I mentioned previously, aren't structured. They don't throw out the caveats of, hey, this might be a particular Rails version, this might be a particular um, Ruby version. Make sure you know these things. And for a junior developer, a blog is probably going to focus on, here was a problem, here's how I solved it, right? It's not going to guide them through understanding the why or the relevance of what that problem was. It's just gonna say, here's some code, this is how I solved this problem. So it can be very confusing to them, particularly when they're just learning the architecture. And I've already talked about the Ruby and Rails versions. Googling for answers, getting them out of the whole copy paste. I've got an error. Let me cut and paste that error into my search bar and see what comes up. Because then there, it's like teaching math by teaching hundreds of um, formulas that you have to memorize rather than teaching you the whys behind the formulas, right? So moving them away from Googling for answers and more Googling towards learning what that actual error means, what it indicates in your code, and how to find out how to fix that but not searching for answers. And then, well, I had a big issue with this one. Most of our junior developers, unless they were an infrastructure people, they have not probably heard of or used IRC. And <laughs> I'm not kidding. So it's, you find in the younger generation, like the millennials and stuff, that they don't know what IRC is. And if they do, it's this evil thing to be, you know, never spoken of again, it's like Voldemort. <laughs> but those that do know what IRC is and have played around with it a little bit, I guess don't know the whole IRC etiquette, and they will just go and start asking the question about everything. Oh, well, I don't understand why my code doesn't do X of all things, right? And if, if you're on IRC, I assume most of you are, that's, you're not going to get an answer. You're going to get flame wars back, right? And so it's very counterproductive. It doesn't help. So what does help? Giving them books. but good books. <laughs> so you go to your bookstore and you could find 50 different books on learning Ruby or learning Rails. Maybe three of those are going to be worth your while. And uh, I don't have it in here yet, but before this gets published, there will be an ex a fairly extensive list of recommendations. So finding ones like from Manning Press or the Learning Ruby with Agile, th those are structured, appropriate books for someone just learning. Finding interactive courses, as long as they guide you from start to finish, 
and explain what you're doing rather than just giving you code. And then blogs, blogs help, certain blogs. <laughs> so you have to find the blogs that, like I said, don't just say, here's a problem, here's how we fixed it. That go into the deeper meat of what that problem meant and how to avoid it in the future. Don't copy and paste code and not getting tired of Googling because you will always be Googling for some answer. The senior developers might not know the answer. They might not be on your team. They might not have shared that through osmosis. So a lot of people will, oh, I get so tired of having to Google for, they'll say Google for answers. You eventually get them to Google to learn something, but they still get tired of Googling. You're gonna be Googling forever. Nobody knows everything. And then the last thing that I try to tell people to do is start reading source code. Join some repos, pull down the actual Rails source code, because you know it's written in Ruby, and read it. It will give you so much insight into the deeper meanings of how things work. So that's actually something I plan on implementing soon as homework assignments for weeks. But we'll see how that goes. I don't think it'll go over well, but. So you've learned all these things. Your options are to try and go work for some company somewhere or under a contract, under you know, a long lasting salaried position or what most people in the Rails community do is freelance. And how many of you freelance? Quite a few. So pros and cons of freelancing, you can be your own boss, enjoy freedom, pick your projects you wanna work on, set your rates, lots of good things there, but a lot of people might not know how to market themselves. I know many technical people have um, a challenge dealing with the social interactions and self-promotion aspects. So, and then of course, being responsible and disciplining yourself. I know I'm personally more productive from say 9 p.m. at night until four in the morning, but that doesn't really work for the rest of the world. So having to get up and be awake at 8 a.m. just like you're going to the office, one of those cons. Time management, because you're, your, you're sitting at your computer at home, you're working on some code, Facebook pops up, oh, it's got a link to something, you've just spent 15 minutes, an hour on Reddit, right? And then emotions, because when you're invested in freelancing, you tend to take things, um, you tend to wear your heart on your sleeve a little more. You, you also don't have the structure of the larger organization to buffer you from, say, client feelings or buffer the clients from yours. And so freelancing is definitely not for the faint of heart, but I would not want that to scare anyone away because it is definitely worth the best shot you can take. Everyone should freelance something. And the rest of this is just kind of, you know Rails, you wanna be a freelancer, here's what you're gonna need. And we've kind of covered most of this, it's just a summary for the freelancing crowd. Although for the freelancers, you're gonna to wanna to expand beyond what you probably need for a salaried position as a Rails developer. So learning the Rails framework is great, but you'll want to probably venture into learning the alternatives to the Rails framework, like Sinatra, you know, Rango, because that will expand the availability of jobs you can take. And here's how to find clients, lots of links there. So finding clients, obviously you're gonna be cruising job boards, but a lot of people don't um, consider that many clients that are going to potentially interview you or take a proposal from you for a job are going to go back and see which open source repos, which projects you've committed to, um, contributed to, and actually take a look at some of your code. Do you have five commits over the last three years or are you very active on two or three projects that you're passionate about? And also contributing to the open source increases your private brand, right? And if you're freelancing, then your private brand is your brand. But everyone should be building their private brand, right? Your own individual brand should be built. And then of course you wanna learn how the other team plays. So when you're trying to get a job, those, it's just like an interview process for hired for a salary position. So you need to know how the person um, fielding the job thinks how they're hiring. So these are some links here to questions that would probably be asked during a Ruby interview and things like that. 
So how to get your first project? And until you get your first project, what do you do? Well, you want to build your profile, your brand. Um, working with Rails, GitHub, LinkedIn, those are... I know that when I interview anyone to work at our company, the first question that I ask is not for a resume, but it's what's your repo? You know, what's your GitHub ID? Oh, you don't have a GitHub ID? Go make one, push up your student code, you know, so. Spend your time creating a website, create a blog, do it in Rails, right? Don't take the easy way out and pay somebody $3 a month, $10 a month hosting for a WordPress site that you can just click and numb, recreate it with Rails, and then start writing. Because the more content you produce, the more your brand is being promoted, and the more confidence that people will have when they hire you. And then that just carries on into getting involved in the community. And you should practice writing emails to employers. Again, this goes back to the whole buffer and corporate policy, corporate um, standards. Many people have a standard way of replying. And if you haven't worked in uh, any sort of corporate atmosphere, I know many Rails developers that are making $100,000, $150,000 a year that dropped out of high school to do that. So they don't have that experience of working in that larger social corporate structure. So practice writing emails as if you're writing them to employers because you will in inevitably write an email that offends an, a client. Um, and then of course, setting up your own individual working process. These are two I use, getting things done and um, Pomodoro. Find what works for you, but make sure you have a process. If that's, I get up at 10 a.m. every day, I do an hour of testing, I do you know, an hour of debugging, I only answer phone calls at 11.30, and then I do yoga for an hour and take a nap. That's fine, just make sure you have a working process that allows you to get things done. And if you're a freelancer, you're going to be stressed. It's kind of the same thing as doing a startup company, and has anybody ever run a startup? No? Right on. It's, it's wonderful and just hateful at the same time. So sometimes you have to kind of step back and get perspective. Take a rest, meditate, go for a walk. I can definitely recommend the last one. If you don't have any non-computer related hobbies, if everything you do centers around the computer in some sort of way, like you know, showering with my iPhone because I have a life proof case on it, it can be bad to be tethered all the time. And there's a, a nice quote here. I took up sword fighting and I just moved into a new house and it was kind of interesting because there's hedges and they were kind of overgrown. I've got a battle ready replica of uh, the ranger sword from Lord of the Rings, hand forged, I mean sharpened. So I'm out there hacking away at the hedges with the sword and lots of cool looks from the neighbors. But it got me away from the computer and it's an outlet for the frustration. And then well, how do you deal with success? Well, as you start getting success, you're gonna start feeling better about yourself. But remember, everything you write is crap, so always keep improving. <laughs> um, hard work's the key to success. Do what you're passionate about. And I guess the, the key takeaway point of this, uh, if you're going to be a freelancer, is that you have to decide how good you wanna be. What level are you aiming for? And be patient and relentless till you get there. And then resources and links. So I'll take a Q&A now. I think that's all I have. Any questions? Yes. We usually give a week to two weeks Ten. for the no 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 for the starter app, and then moving them on to their own project. 
It really tips. depends upon the complexity of the projects and the uh, aptitude of the mentor that you've assigned to them. Because they're obviously not going to be able to learn past the level of their mentor or their teacher. It, it's hard to judge. What do you mean by up to speed? Do you mean they could go and create anything by themselves? Well, you're just not going to, you're not, you're not going to take a new rail dev and just give them to a client and expect them to be productive. Yeah. Uh, the, the question was, how long does it take to um, get a rails dev up to speed and actually um, uh, pr uh, produce him for the company in, instead of uh, just uh, learning his craft uh, because you know he's got to learn all your corporate sta or he's got to learn all your corporate standards. Take a while from that, yeah. He's got to learn the standards, and you know it's it's just going to take time. You know? And if you can do it faster in three months, I'd be uh, I'd be surprised. Nah, I, I was I was going to say easily three to six months. It depends upon the foundational skills that they have when they come in. But we've had a few, uh, I would say one, maybe two, that have hit that point where they actually start making money for the company rather than costing us money within seven weeks, eight weeks. But those are, they're making money on the, the quick tasks, you know? So you couldn't give them some of the deeper architectural things or the, the more complex features and expect them to, to start building money on that they're still going to be learning his craft if they're working on those. So. But as far as three to six months would be my, yeah, three to six months, sure. Uh, you, want now? you definitely don't want to hold them around a year or more. Hello, oh, okay. Uh, how much of Rails is built on the MVC uh, programming paradigm? Um, is, is that the whole thing? No, um, Rails is built off of MVC, but it also incorporates several other patterns. So you'll see services come in, you'll see, and it's changed with Rails 4 as compared to Rails 3. So the early versions of Rails were pretty uh, rigid in their adherence to the MVC structure, but as Rails has developed, while that's still the core, they give you more avenues for venturing outside of those patterns. Uh, as far as a percentage, I don't know, I can say, what, 60, 80? Rails itself is built off of an MVC framework, but there's definitely ways to get out of that now. So. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Um, I've noticed that uh, at my place of employment, they really primarily view Rails as a prototyping system. So we have uh, a few Rails apps that have been running bulletproof for years, and I'm constantly having to fight the, okay, when are we going to make a production, you know, which means PHP app out of these? Um, what are what is a good case to make? How can I explain it to pe people who only know PHP and who everything is PHP and who the universe is coded in PHP that it's, it's okay to have this other framework running our production uh, code as well? That's, a, that's an interesting question because we have several folks. They don't teach Rails, obviously, in any of the, the schools around us. So everyone that comes out has PHP. That's the only web language that they know. And, but they don't teach the frameworks. So I think the deeper ingrained you get into larger, uh, wider PHP community, you start learning you know, Zend and, and various frameworks, you're going to want to fall back on what you already know. So Rails is faster, Rails is quicker, Ruby is a much more robust language. Personally, PHP sucks. <laughs> but yeah, you, you just kind of have to guide them through and show by, show by example, because we've moved from uh, 
using Rails as a prototype, or more recently as a prototyping language. Rails has always been our core business, but instead of using it as our, our prototyping language, we're using things like you know Angular, Meteor JS, that can just rapidly develop something all living in a single page app kind of thing. So, which is a good thing because it builds up those JavaScript skills. But yeah, you just kind of have to guide them into it slowly and show them. Say, it took you 19 hours to write all of the controllers and everything for that PHP app. I just did it in nine seconds with Rails. So. It's definitely, if, if they appreciate speed and efficiency and not having to you know, repeat themselves, those are core principles of Ruby and Rails. Whereas in PHP, you'll repeat yourselves. I mean, it's like in Java, right? You have to have all those stupid little getters and setters. So that, that's how I would approach it. As opposed to just being the dictator and say, you can't touch PHP while you're, you're here. But that's well, if I were in a <laughs> position to, be a, a, to make that dictatorial decision, I would. but. Uh, I have to play nicely with upper management. Yeah, I understand that completely. Luckily, my upper management is on my side on that one. So, <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Cool. Well, I thank you all for coming today. And the slides will be up. There will be a copious amount of links and resources included. So, if you wanted to take these slides and you don't know Rails, you could become a Rails developer. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.